have you interested for two years? Um, so, first of all, so my name is Pierre Pistulet. I work in Grenoble and France at Ikea. Just one slide. So, who am I? So, I started working with microrobots quite a long time ago. In 97, I did my master thesis in microrobots, I did my PhD thesis in microrobots, and now I will tell you about microrobots. You see a constant there. I was joking when I did my PhD saying, well, you know, there's still a piston more used to work on that. And now I don't think that anymore. And I hope that in 10 years I have stopped working on microrobots. Um, so during this time, I had I already have some achievements, I'm quite proud of. So, um, what I mean is that, well, you can trust me, but it's my goal. My brothers have been developing the HR2 robots. So, one of the HR2 robots, I will show you the picture if you don't know it. One of them in Japan, you just migrate them every day. That's the, the standard operating in this world. And the now robot, the only walk, the latest algorithm that you have in now robots, in fact, an implementation of, of my papers. They didn't ask me for the for my algorithm, they wanted to repeat the code it the old way, but it's one of my algorithms. So if you're happy with it, it's, you can thank me. If you're not happy, it's there for please. Um, however, I never participated to any robot. So what I'm going to tell you is how to make those robots work, what are the standard algorithms. So of course, if you want to win the robot cup, you want to be faster than the standard algorithm, so you want to be better than what I, I showed you. So I'm not going to show you how to win, i just show you how the standard thing work, works, so that then you can try to improve it, and then share with us your improvements. So, what I propose to show you today, so first of all, we'll be discussing the dynamics of leg locomotion to show how this impact the stability and then how you analyze this and how you can propose solutions. Then focus on how you generate dynamic force motions. Then uh, we will focus more precisely on motion and force control. And those three parts are what appears in the lecture notes. So this is a yeah, chapter which will be in the handbook of robotics next year. So just an extract. And basically doing those, look for those three things that we follow the flow of, of the notes, so you can follow um, and then take notes if you want. You have then more precise uh, references in, in, in the paper notes. Uh, I skip a, a lot of things in, in, in the notes, so here I think it's one of the important things, but uh, I'm sure you can follow it. But then I, I wanted to add uh, also some, some details about how you can do for people's special on that in the, in the, in the chat. So, I'm going to speak about dynamics and stability. So, just to know who knows uh, Lagrangian dynamics. Okay, so some of you. Who knows Newton and Euler uh, uh, equations? Okay. And who knows Lyapunov? What is a Lyapunov function? So, uh, some of you, so here, this is the, the, this will be the hardest part to follow in the talk, the beginning. So, it's good everybody is well awake. Um, however, if you don't know anything about Lagrangian dynamics and Newton and Euler equations, some of you apparently will have a problem with that. It's not that important. I want to show how you go from the abstract model, complete model of the robot, how you form, then you end up with some simple equations. So when we end this, we end this with some simple equations, and then you can follow from here. So don't be afraid by that. So I guess that if you are here, it's maybe because you want to shape the future, you want to work on the help improve robots in the future. And I think it's always good to start, if you want to know how to improve in the future, it's good to know where we are. And then is to reflect on where we were, what came, what brought us here, and a little bit about the history. So I'm going to show you a few videos that you see what was the progress uh, 50 years ago, 30 years ago, 15 years ago, and then you can see how where we are now okay, with, with, with this uh, long term. So in the 60s, it was quite impressive. I showed the, the, the video, a uh, work uh, 
Mm. So then in the US, by, by a Ralph Mocker, uh, that was the walking track. And you would see this very impressive track on four legs, and it worked already 50 years ago. But there was no computer control at that time. It was man control. So there was the man inside the truck and who was controlling all the planets. And of course, it was very tiring. After 50 minutes of concentration, the guy was off, you know, that flat battery of, of the human controller. In the 70s, uh, began the, the, the main research on, on leg robots began in the 70s. Especially, you have um, very famous Waseda University began building human robots at that time. Professor Ichiro Kato there. And that's impressive because 40 years later they are still working on human robots. So during 40 years, during full four decades, they are having a driving force in leg robots. But by the end of the 70s, beginning of the 80s, all leg robots were working with quasi static motion, so slow motion. Um, however, you have like, you know, one, one great achievement in the mid 80s was the adaptive suspension vehicle. So this time it was a, a hexapod carrying a, a, a human driver, but the human driver at that time was only using a joystick. And then you had a full wheel autonomous motion. I'm going to show the videos because that's really impressive to think that well, 30 years ago you had already great, great things happening. But as I, as I told you at that time, Quasi static motion was the rule. And it was about in the, mid in the beginning of the 80s that uh, in Tokyo University, I don't mention it, but in the, in the written notes, uh, you had the first truly dynamic walking by the robot. So it was 30 years ago. But what was even more impressive was the work done by Mark Rayburg in the MIT Lake Lab. Uh, Mark Rayburg, if you don't know him, when he left the MIT Leg Lab, he, in the mid 90s, he funded Boston Bionics, which now is the big dog robot, and, and uh, Atlas, and Petman, and for the Barber Challenge. So you see, once again, a, a huge driving force for leg robots here for, for 30 years. But the big shock was 15 years ago, uh, Honda revealed their uh, prototype, was the peak, was before Asimov. It was such a shock at that time that um, the video of the, the human robot was aired on every national TV all around the world. It was really impressive. And you can see when you see these videos that, well, in the last 15 years, well, I think we haven't got much further than someone. So, just spend some time. This is the walking truck. And, and then you kind of have. So you have the driver, which is here, and you can see that he, when he lifts the arm and the leg, he controls everything. Right? But I guess it was quite cool to be there, I'm not sure. So you have this big truck, then you have maybe a little bit. No, sorry. Here. Because you can see him with a, you can see him with a jeep there. So you can give so much. Power in this. So that was kind of ideas they had at that time, what the robot could be had before. So just showing, so this is the hexapod built in the mid 80s, so in the US again. And so you can see a great improvement uh, 20 years later. Uh, once again, very impressive. Then you have the dynamic hoppers at MIT Tech Lab. And so it is, so just a personal note, it's by seeing these videos at that time that I said to work on black robots. I thought it was really great to try to do the same thing. But then, big shock in, the, in 1996, the Honda robot. And just at that time, I was, I was going to begin my PhD thesis and then appear this robot. And I, you know, with some of my friends who were, were just wondering, should we just stop? The problem is solved. Uh, why do a PhD thesis on that? And yeah, 15 years later, you still have students making their PhD thesis on, on this topic. 
However, you can see that it was already quite impressive. Really impressive. Okay, so I think the question is, you know, how the problem looked solved at that time. What is still not solved yet? And why do we still need to work on this on, on this topic? So this is an, an open question. I won't give you the answer, but just try to think about why we, you know we still are still working on that. Okay, so now equations. The dynamics of leg locomotion. Everything starts with how you describe how you describe the posture of a robot. And this will impact all the rest of the equations. When you describe with the minimum set of coordinates, what's the posture of the robot you need, of course, you're used to using joint positions, which here we call Q hat. And you also need, of course, to, to, to uh, describe the position and orientation with respect to the environment. So, position and orientation. And here you can see a obvious structure, and this structure reflects in what we call the Lagrangian dynamics. So this is the Lagrangian dynamics. For those who don't know it, that's just a more general way to write the dynamics of a multi-body uh, system like a human robot. And basically it's a generalization of usual things. Because it's written in a way that you can easily see that here you have the mass, here you have the acceleration, here's the acceler acceleration due to gravity, and then you have forces. You have uh, joint torques, contact forces, and here inertial forces like Coriolis effects and uh, centrifugal effects. So basically, what you have is like the Newton equation: you have mass times acceleration equal the sum of forces. Okay. But so here, the mass is in fact the mass matrix, which is um, the size of the number of degrees movement of your robot. And the acceleration is, of course, the acceleration of all these degrees of temperature. And then you have this structure appearing again. What you can see is that the joint torques uh, have an effect only at the level of the joint motion. And so if we suppose that we don't have any problem with joint torques, then at least we have some problem, so meaning that joint, you don't have any strong limit on joint torques, then you can always realize whatever joint motion you want. But here you can see that you have some, some part of the equation of dynamics where the joint torques don't have a direct effect. And what you will need is contact forces. So let's focus on those two parts of the dynamics. In fact, you can show very easily that if you take the lines here, so you, have, you use a combination of joint acceleration, position acceleration, and, and rotation, Acceleration, but then this combination gives you the mass of the robot times the acceleration of the center of mass. And here, what you have is in the same line here, you have the sum of the force. So, what you have is in fact the Newton equation of for the pull of the robot mass times acceleration equals sum of the forces, so gravity acceleration and contact forces in this case. The, the third part here. In the same way, you can show that it's in fact the Euler equation for your own robot. So then we are going to focus on those two things because here those two equations don't depend on joint torques, and you can see that you can then make a motion of the center of mass only by using contact forces. You, you depend on contact forces to move. The Euler equation, I write it that way. So here you have the derivative of the angular momentum. The angular momentum, you have this nasty equation but that we don't care about. So you have the, the derivative of the angular momentum, which is equal to the sum of torques. So what happens if you have no external force, no contact force, with zero, zero gravity, and zero time? So obviously, if you have the acceleration of the center of mass, which is zero. So if you start with zero velocity, you, don't, you can't. And here you have conservation of the angular momentum. Let's look at a simulation. Here you are in space. It's a simulation in space. You have this human model which is walking in space, no external force. So conservation of momentum. And it was zero in the beginning, it's zero in the end, but it has turned. And 
when I asked my master students, um, so where is the mistake? Have I made a mistake in my simulation? And unfortunately, at least half of them believe that I made a mistake in my simulation. So I didn't, and this is so a real dynamic effect. You have conservation of momentum, which is always equal to zero, the angle and yet it moves. Who knows why? So that's an important thing to realize, in fact, here. That, so if you, there's a, there's a mathematical word for this angular momentum, it's called non holonomic Which means that even though you keep this value constant, you don't have any constant in x. So, you don't have any constant in theta, x, and q. So what that means, more practically speaking, is that here, even though, so I can show you maybe myself, even though I would have no contact force, if I move my hand like that, okay, I will, of course, move my body in this direction a little bit. Now, if I move my hand here, I don't create any rotation. And if I move it like that, I will create a rotation the other way, but slightly less because I have less inertia in my hand. And then I can, so if I do it like that, I can rotate. This is exactly how cats fall back on their feet. They don't, they can't push on anything. They can't push on the air, it's too thin. And yet they can move around. What they do is that they modify, they do exactly this motion with, with legs. Okay, so they, what they modify, and it's so, and it appears to be exactly the same motion that you do when you walk. So when you walk, by doing that, okay, you, you change the inertia of your legs while moving forward and backward. So you create some rotation. So here you create some rotation even though you have zero angular momentum. So now the question is, of course, when we walk, we don't rotate. Even though we have this effect. Here it was a, a, a no cap motion it was recorded on the human replay, so that's a true walking motion. And if you do it with zero momentum, you turn. And when you do it, now the ground you don't turn. So of course, that means that you have a non-zero momentum when you walk. So you have this very strange thing to grasp that if you impose a zero momentum to a robot, it's going to fall. It's going, it's going to turn exactly that way. Because when you walk, well, you have a naughty one I'm not going to spend too much time to discuss this, but just saying that this is a very complex issue, the problem of angular momentum. And that's maybe it's because it's tricky, and that I guess is the main reason why a lot of people should avoid it. And they say, oh, well, we don't care about angular momentum. Consider that then to be a motivation. Because it's a very tough problem to deal with. Okay, so we have these equations of motion. Now, what happens when you walk on a flat ground? Okay, let's suppose we walk on a flat ground. So what we're going to do is sum those two equations. But first, I multiply this one by C cross product. So I take the cross product with the position of the center of mass. So C is the position of the center of mass. So I take C cross times this, and C dot cross times this, and I add. So by adding, I will remove this term here. This is what happens on the next slide. So I have C times the left part of the Newton equation, plus the left part of the other equation, and then I this. And then I divide this by the Z coordinate of the Newton equation. So here I take the Z coordinate, Z coordinate, Z coordinate, <laughs> and I divide term by term. Excuse me? Yes. What is PI? Oh yes, sorry, it's the position of the contact points. So yeah, so here you have the position of the contact point with respect to the center of mass, so then that gives you the torque generated by the contact force. Okay. okay, so we do this transformation here. And then we focus on the x and y coordinates here. 
So, we, so here what we have is that we have first the x and y coordinates of c times the z coordinates of here. So, and then you divide by this, and so you just end up having the x and y coordinates plus the plus. Then here, what you have is the z coordinate here times the x and y coordinates here. So you have this equation here, and you have the mass which is becoming. Okay. Then here, you have this term here, and you have a sign matrix here because I, 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 I change signs. In the equation, but that's, that's it. And here, the important thing is that if I work on a flat ground, let me consider that the z coordinates of all the contact points is equal to zero. So the pi z is equal to zero. So here we have the z coordinates times the x and y coordinates, but that's zero. And then I have the z coordinates times the x and y coordinates. So that's why I have here. Z coordinates of the force times the x and y coordinates of the contact points. So that was that was quite boring, but the, the, the end point is interesting. What appears here, you have a sum of the position of the contact points, but this sum is weighted by the normal force. What this is, you have the contact points, you have well, vertical force, normal force, and then you have this point, which we call Z, which is the weight itself. This point is the center of pressure. And an important thing is that if those forces are only positive, and they can only be positive if you can only push on the ground, so if you're not sticking to the ground, they must be positive. And if you you are not sticking to the ground, then this, this center of pressure must be inside the convex hull of the contact point. So inside the support window. That's, that's really important. Okay, so we have this equation here, and here I just rewrote it. So just redispatch the, the terms. So I call this Z now. Z, X, and Y. So I, I consider C minus Z plus this angle here, and then here I have the acceleration uh, along X and Y of the center of mass. So here you can see that I consider the X and Y coordinates of gravity. Why am I doing this? Well, because here I consider a flat ground, but it can be flat, but not horizontal. So here what I took is a Z coordinate, which is orthogonal to the ground, but I wrote a completely general equation, even for walking on a slope. So this is correct, whatever the flat ground you're walking on. So you have some gravity along x and y if you are on the field. So here you can see three terms. One is acceleration. You have, and this acceleration of the center of mass parallel to the ground is related to gravity. To this vector between the position of the center of mass and the position of the center of pressure, and then the angular moment. So you can visualize this here. If you have a center of mass here, and the center of pressure there, and the center of pressure must stay in the support polygon. So you have a vector which goes from z to the center of pressure. To this vector, you add the effect of gravity if you have some gravity along your plane, and then the angular momentum. And this gives you the acceleration. So in case, in case you are walking on a horizontal ground, you don't have this vector. In case you want to avoid dealing with the angular momentum, then this vector is like a very complete. And you can see then uh, what you can also feel that when the center of mass is here and when the center of pressure is there, then obviously the center of mass is going to accelerate in this direction. Okay? So there's no need to take just mass into account. Uh, you so so first of all here I'm dealing with uh, supposedly rigid bodies. Okay, so 
what I understand is sheer stress here would be the, maybe the rotation of shear stress. Okay, so the touching point. Okay, so so which would be related to the friction coefficient. So, so it can be a cons uh, constraint. Uh, here, I haven't spoken about the constraints on the contact force. Okay. I just focused so far on the, um, uh, the fact that it can be only uh, directed upwards. So in the paper, I discussed a little bit about uh, friction. It happens that it's not such a problem uh, usually for walking. Okay. So it hasn't been the main uh, focus. So uh, you can have some problem with friction when you have both feet on the ground, because then if you don't synchronize the two motion, then obviously you have some, some slipping motion. It can be a problem if you want to accelerate very fast, because of course the acceleration of the center of mass is related to the force. But it happens that normally robots don't accelerate that much, and it's not such a problem. I have so colleagues in, in Japan, I remember, they, they made a paper on how to deal with these uh, friction constraints. And they had to work hard to make, uh, to find the surface where the, it would be a problem. So they really had to use a wet metal surface so that the robot won't sleep on it. So in most situations, it's considered to be not. Now, if you want to introduce it, you can. I'm not going to discuss this because it's not very important. Of course, it's, it's possible to deal with it. With our skating robot, that turned into a fire challenge. Then, because skates are interesting in that respect because your ground reaction force is very strong sideways and basically zero. Yes, but usually in this case, you consider the, the limit, which is you consider to have absolute friction in one direction. And absolutely no friction in one direction. So, you, so once again, you just get rid of this friction coefficient by considering that you have a non-rhythmic constraint that you can go free in one direction and absolutely not in the other direction. So that's usually what's done. Okay, so, <coughs> so we have this equation here. So. What happens now if you walk on a horizontal ground? Then you get rid of this. What happens if you consider that you walk more or less horizontally? So that you have very small logical acceleration. So you can pull it out this term. And what if you just consider that, well, let's pull it out this term. It's really Problem. So you end up having this model. So this is where I will stop speaking about mechanics. So now, you'll, so now you just have to, to, to focus on this equation. And in this equation, you still have the main component, which is the acceleration of the center of mass is related to the, the position, the relative position of the center of mass and the center of friction. So it happens that this equation, so it's linear, it's linear because if you consider that you don't have much vertical motion in the past, this is a constant, and this is a constant. So it's a linear equation. It happens to be equivalent to the equation of an inverted pendulum when you linearize it. So it, has, it is often called the linear inverted pendulum model, which is how it was called uh, by the uh, Soviet Union. So, but you can see that it's not, it's not just a linearized equation of an inverted pendulum. How we derived it so far, this equation is absolutely, absolutely uh, correct in all cases. There was no approximation here. <coughs> the only thing that we did at that time was mostly to work on the flat ground, because that's the only way to introduce the center of pressure. If you don't work on a flat ground, there's no definition, no good definition of the center of pressure. So here we just walk on a flat ground. And from, the, from this, from here to here, we just consider that we work on a horizontal ground and we walk without much horizontal motion, uh, vertical motion, so only horizontal motion. And the only approximation that we made was not constraints. So it's not 
just an approximate model. Uh, I, I, I want to insist on this. So now we focus on this equation. So what if you happen to make your steps here, and for some reason you cannot make steps beyond this red line? There's a gap. You can't walk. And what happens if your center of mass is just not going outwards here? So as we saw in the previous drawing, since your center of pressure must be somewhere here, and your center of mass is suddenly going there, it's going to accelerate in this direction endlessly. You cannot do anything else but accelerate in this direction. So how about divergence? You can solve this equation, of course, it's a linear equation. So it's a linear equation, but in, in, in this equation here, Z was not uh, chosen. It's a free variable, and it can be freely chosen in, in this set. So maybe we solve it with an equation. We just said that Z is on this side. So then we have the acceleration, which is going in this direction. So you solve this, and you have uh, exponential appearing. Of course, it's a linear, second order linear uh, dynamics. So what you can see is that if you solve this equation, that you diverge, and you diverge exponentially. And that will be an important thing to, to use later. So obviously you are going to fall, that's what it means. So what you can see is that you can be in situations where you haven't fallen yet, but you are bound to fall. You are going to fall, what are you going to do? If you can't here, make a prop step, you are going to fall. And there's a mathematical theory behind it. Uh, it's called violative theory. You have in such situations where you have states where whatever you do, you are going to fall. And this then will be called a non viable state. And you have situations where if you do the right thing, you can avoid to fall. Of course, if you, if you do the wrong thing, you can always fall. Okay? So it's just an option between. If you do the right thing, you can avoid to fall, or whatever you do, you're going to fall. <laughs> and of course, we want to be in a state where we have an option to avoid to fall. So our goal is to always keep our state viable. So the problem is, how can you, can you know if you are viable or not? How can you know that it's too late? Whatever you're going to do, you're going to fall, so you shouldn't avoid the state. How can you know it? Of course, you can know some special cases. So like, like fixed points. If you are standing like that, you know it's a viable option. If you have a motion which leads you to a fixed point. Okay? Or if you have a cycle, like if you are walking through a cycle, or any motion which leads you to a cycle. So you can know some special cases. But generally speaking, give me the state of the robot and tell me if it's viable or not. Then you have to test all the options, you know, all the possible motions, in order to decide if you find one which allows you to. So, in the general case, deciding whether where a uh, state is viable or not cannot be answered. So, it's a very interesting mathematical theory, but with no use in engineering. However, in our case, remember that for this. Uh, simple dynamics, if you diverge, you diverge exponentially. So, you know that if you focus on the integral of the norm of any derivative of the center of mass, see, because if you diverge exponentially, then it means that the speed diverges exponentially, the acceleration rate diverges exponentially, any derivative diverges exponentially. So, if you, just, if you focus on such an integral, if a motion falls and this integral is infinite, and if it's finite, it means that you, you have a motion which avoids to fall. So maybe if you try to minimize this integral, if you try to do some optimal control of it, and trying to keep it as low as possible and hopefully finite then you will choose a motion which avoids to fall uh, this way, okay? But unfortunately, here you have an integral uh, till infinity. You have, because you're never sure if you haven't reached infinity. 
But of course, you can compute on an infinite path. And you, so I think, uh, although it would, it would be interesting anyway to have an infinite plan with all the because your all the solution might change. So, another term, which was introduced by Jerry Grass uh, seven years ago, was the idea of capturability. So instead of trying to know if you can avoid to fall in the end, maybe in a, in a century, well, let's focus on if you can avoid to fall in one step, or two steps, or three steps. So you just decide a finite amount of steps, so then you have a finite time problem <coughs> and decide if you can avoid to fall or not. So that's the idea of capturability. Impose that you can stop in one step or two steps. And his claim, which is, I think, quite convincing, is that that's all you need. And usually when you are a human, um, either you can stop in two or three steps, or you're going to fall. Anyway. So the difference between being able to stop in two or three steps and then the more general approach, the difference is very clear. So that's just enough to consider that we can always stop in one or two. Now, how can you decide if your state, your state, your state is capturable or not? Hopefully, Jerry Pat continued his uh, analysis of the situation and introduced uh, what he called the capture point. And that is that was perhaps the, the, the most important uh, result in the last decade, realizing the importance of this capture point. In fact. This, so the capture point is just T. So you just take the position of the center of mass, and you have to meet its speed, weighted by the um, omega, which is the, the time constant of your planet. And you just consider this value here. In fact, this value has been introduced in many different ways uh, around the same time. So Jerry Pratt called it the capture point. I don't remember the name, so in biomechanics it was called the extrapolated center of mass. And then engineers in Honda, with you know, all the same idea, and they called it the divergent part of the vertex. And the, those three terms correspond to three different properties of this value C. That we're going to see in this slide. So if you just rewrite, reorder this equation. And that's what we do here. We have then the speed of the center of mass is proportional to the difference between C, the position of the capture point, and the position of the center of mass. Here you have a first order linear dynamics, but it's converging. You see that since omega is positive, C is converging to C. So C is the point where the center of mass is going, which is obvious if you, if you consider this definition. Okay, so that's why it was called the extrapolated center of mass. That's really where your center of mass is going. And then if you if you if you introduce this change of variable in in uh, the linear dynamics that we have here, just rewrite things very very simply in a in a few minutes, and you end up with this dynamics of of uh, the capture point. So the Speed of the capture point is proportional to the position of the capture point with respect to the center of pressure. Okay. But here it's a diverging speed. So here C is moving away from Z. The capture point is moving away from the center of pressure. So the center of mass is moving towards the capture point, but the capture point is moving away from the center of pressure. So you can have this in, in, in this plot here. So if you we have the center of mass here, the center of pressure here, you have the speed of the center of mass, and then you have the capture point which is here. So what happens is that the capture point will go away. So you, the speed will be in this direction with respect to the, the center of pressure. So the capture point is going in this direction. But the center of mass is going towards the capture point. And the combination of those two First, the dynamics gives you an acceleration of the center of mass, which goes in this direction. So it goes with this speed, but with this acceleration. So it will go like that. <sighs> Is it clear? So what happens is that 
here we have the two units. So the same, so the second order linear dynamics that we have here is in fact really it's, has been re re rewritten here as two one order, one uh, first order dynamics. One being on diverging and the other being diverging. So now you know why the engineers in Honda called it the divergent of the dynamics. Then they said what we should do is focus on then this value of C and controlling because that's the unstable part of the dynamics. The motion center of mass, no problem. It's just going to follow this. So what you just need to control is this value. And then it's called the capture point. And why? Because if so, if you see the if you have the plot here, if C is here, then you can decide to put your foot here. And if you decide to put your foot here, then you can decide to put Z exactly below C. Below C. So in, this, in that case, Z and C are in the same position, for example. So C doesn't move, and C doesn't move, and the center of mass converges to it, and then you stop. So you can see it can be questioned here. Here you have zero, so here you have zero speed, and then you have C dot, which is converging to C. So the capture point can be used to tell you that if you put your step there here, you're going to stop. So that was quite a new, you see very simple equations, but a, a major observation has in, in uh, understanding what is this. So, how are we going to use all this to generate dynamic Um Now I'm going to have a, a big chunk that, that I think would be interesting to maybe not interrupt. So I'm not sure if it's time to have a pause now, or we we are having to already finish for this talk, and then we will go for another 20 or 30 minutes now. So either you want your break now, because we went through the hardest part of the talk. This was the hardest part. A lot of the equations. I'm I'm sorry about that, but I hope that it can give you a connection between the whole body model and the what we need to do. So. I need to send inside. Yeah, <coughs> actually, the break is scheduled in uh, about uh, 37 minutes. Okay. <laughs> we have time. So, we have time. So, how do you use this? Uh, early schemes in the 80s and 90s were the following two ideas. First, first idea was. Well, we have this wonderful numerical tool that uh, people in numerical optimization work on. You can solve you know, trajectories for rockets to send rockets to Jupiter. So why not make a robot walk? So just write down the equations, as we did the whole equations, and, and just ask your numerical optimizer to find you a good trajectory to say that you want to minimize uh, the energy, for example, and that's it. The problem is it doesn't work. Numerical methods are not that uh, clever. So, um, it's, only, it's only 10 years ago that it began to work. And only in, in simple cases, and it takes a lot of time. And so, one of the best results in this field, uh, I think, is obtained by Katia Bombauer and Fanny Bird. But apart from her, very few people manage to just say, this is a cool dynamics of my robot, just give me a walking motion. That doesn't Then you have a very interesting idea. It was the, the most successful idea, which was, which was proposed by, uh, first by Professor Kogradovich in the end of the 70s, and which he called the artificial synergy synthesis. The idea is that, so we have this equation here. And the observation that this equation is only in two dimensions. So here you have a connection between the motion system of mass, the position system of pressure, and the element. But, so, because the position of the center of mass is constrained, 
you have these two equations that give you two constraints of the motion, but only two constraints. What about the rest of the motion? I haven't spoke, spoken uh, about the oh, joint motion. I, after the, the first few slides, I spoke about it. So his idea here was to say, well, you can choose any joint motion that you want, but it's not a too crazy one, and then just assign a few degrees of freedom of your system to satisfy this constraint. So his original idea in the 70s was to say, well, let's use pre-recorded walking motions. Okay. And then you just use the arms to keep your equilibrium. Okay. So what he was using is in fact so predefining the whole motion, joint motion of the system. Except for two degrees of freedom, which would which would modify here the angular momentum of your system. So it was a purely theoretical idea in the 70s, but it was realized in the end of the 80s uh, in uh, the Waseda University, as I mentioned. So they had this uh, robot which was playing a predefined motion. You had inertia wheels there turning uh, around, and it was. So they were, they were turning a lot in order to compensate for all the dynamic effects which were uh, re because of the pre-recorded motion. Um, so it turns out that this idea has been uh, followed too closely by people later. They, they said, oh, okay, maybe we should do that. So what we should do is pre-record the motion and then use a few degrees of freedom. And that gave rise to what's called the ZMP approach. Uh, because here, of course, since you define, you predefine the position of the steps, you can predefine the position of the center of pressure. Okay. So then it's just a matter of, of then solving this equation to find how to regulate your, your motion. So here what you would have is that you predefine most of your motion. So of course that limits your reactivity. Here, you see this, this idea was used to track a single motion, but what if it cannot be tracked? Then you, you know, just uh, uh, you have no other option. So this robot in Marcella University was walking with his arms were uh, turning around just to equilibrate, but you shouldn't push it. Because then the arms will try to equilibrate more, but if they can't because you have joint limits, well it's going to fall. But you can see that um, it's, it's a limit that, you, that is not imposed to you. You are free to decide. You, know, you can still use this artificial solution and still, still use it with free step motion. And that's something that we're going to discuss. But just mentioning that this general idea of saying, well, you know, most of the motion is not relevant, and only a few degrees of freedom are important, and especially the motion of the center of mass and the angular momentum gave rise to a, a very interesting uh, domain of research, which, which is called complex analytics. And I believe uh, maybe Moritz Mars, he, he mentioned it uh, in his uh, uh, in his lecture presentation. So I don't know if he talked about that templates, templates. But usually that's the kind of things that people in biomechanics use, and basically. Um, that means, well, you know, focus on few degrees of freedom and follow the rest. And that's exactly the same idea. So, how can we use this, uh, but without the rigidity of having offline generating motion? So, what would be interesting in online motion generation? Because then, of course, that will help you have better reactivity if you have perturbations or if you want to change. Your goal because your ball, the ball wants to go there, but then the ball is there. So, well, so you need online machine generation for it. The problem is if you keep regenerating your motion, so you keep recomputing your motion every millisecond, for example, how can you make sure that you don't change your mind every time and in the end you end up being unstable? You know, if you if you say left, right, left, right, maybe you're just going to fall in the end. So how can you make sure that in the long term, changing your mind doesn't destabilize you? So here we are going to build on 
on, on this observation that we made that maybe this integral of the norm of any derivative of the motion, especially of the motion in super mass, because maybe you know we know that if we want to take this small, then we stay stable, we stay viable, then, then stay. So let's do propose um, uh, to have just four slides on on optimal and um, model predictive control. Because that's, we will see that that's what is unique in every robot, uh, working robot in the world, or nearly every robot. We are going to see uh, in, in a few slides, but let me tease you with that, how the Asimov robot works, how the Toyota robot works, how the Sunny Q used to work, and how the HF2 works, and how the NAL works. So all those robots, they all work the same set of ideas. Or at least you can see that they share a lot of, of similar design. So, speaking about first optimal control. So here, I switch to some discrete time dynamics. So we have the current state of the system, and then you, you decide for a certain control and you to the next state. Okay, so you have this discrete time dynamics. And then what you want to do is minimize an infinite sum, which is disguised with you know, our infinite input. So I have a result in optimal control that enter under some technical uh, conditions uh, which are satisfied here, but you should always read the fine things when you sign the contract, so you should always take care about those technical assumptions. Then this function that you want to minimize can be used as a gap law function. So I'm not going to speak more about gap law functions. Then basically what that means is that this Integral is going to decrease with time, which can look a bit obvious. That sorry, if you have this integral starting at a time t zero and then starting at the next time, the next time of course, the amount of time for the integral is going to reduce, so this integral is going to decrease. And since it decreases, if it was finite, it will stay finite. So if you manage to have a controller which continuously minimizes this. And keeps it decreasing, you will stay stable. You are going to avoid control. So optimal control is the option. Now the problem, of course, is that we still have this infinite sum, and that's where model predictive control comes. In model predictive control, you have this uh, milestone paper. Um, so um, what? They propose to do is well use a finite sum, but then after these n steps of control that you need to want to anticipate, just impose that you have reached your goal. Okay, and in this case you can show that this function is still decreasing, so that this truncated integral is decreasing. It's truncated, but you have imposed that you have reached your goal in the end. And here you can see the connection between. Viability and captureability. In viability, we're considering the infinite integral. But with captureability, it was proposed that maybe you consider a finite motion, uh, but you impose that you stop after those two or three steps. So, in fact, this uh, switch between optimal control and model control corresponds to the switch between long, infinite, potentially infinite viable motion. And so this is the general theory about the MPC, but in fact you have many variants where you can modify how you deal with this constraint, modify how you deal with this uh, minimization, and you have two extremes. And we are going to see those two extremes because it's interesting to observe that for walking robots, only those two extremes have been First extreme is well, forget about this minimization. You just find a motion, so a control rule, which leads you to stopping after n steps. Just find it. And then, and then play it. And then if you have a perturbation, then recompute. But of course it doesn't work like that. It's not because you would 
have the same problem, if you keep recomputing, then you may might end up falling. So here you have a pretty, pretty complex way of deciding when you should recompute and how you should recompute to be sure that you are stable. So there are stability you can detect only if you recompute in a proper way, which is quite complex to, to or you have the other extreme, which is just thought about the constraint. <laughs> just consider a truncated sum. And if your n is big enough, if your horizon uh, with which you anticipate is long enough, then you can show that it's stable also. So from the original MPC, Scheme. In one case, you just follow the constraint and take n big enough. And for walking motion, n big enough is one step. One step is big enough. Of course, the longer your horizon, the more uh, better your choice. You have you, you anticipate more, so you can, you can make better choices. And usually, you will just anticipate for two steps. Okay? So they optimize it for two steps. Some people try three steps, but usually it doesn't. Improve anything. So two steps is fine. So either you just truncate for two steps, or you don't want to minimize anything, that you just impose that you stop after the two steps. Okay, so that goes to these three extremes. Now we can see we're ready to just browse through all the methods which are used on the robots that we know and just see how they fit with this general theory. So first of all, because that's historically the first approach that I mentioned, predefined two steps. Okay, so so far, people suppose that the two steps are given and are fixed. And then first, uh, methods which consider the captureability constraint and no optimization of the derivative of the center of mass. Or then you have, so historically, it was at a university. What they use is, in fact, the multiple mass model. They consider multiple mass, but here you have the same equation for multiple mass. The position of the mass, the acceleration, and you divide by the vertical acceleration, the vertical position. So this, then you have an iterative process to solve, to, to make this value converge to a predefined um, uh, center of pressure. Okay, so you have a trajectory for a center of pressure, and then you solve this equation to find a motion which, which will satisfy the, the, the dynamics. And they use a quite complex uh, iterative process based on uh, fast Fourier transform. It's really very complex. Um, and they impose in some way, but it's not very clear in the videos, <coughs> that they must always be able to solve in two steps. So what they do is just compute a motion, which is feasible with respect to the dynamics here, and which is able to stop two steps, then in two steps. It should always be able to stop in two steps, but it doesn't stop in two steps, of course. It's just, when you make one step, it's just important that you be able to stop two steps later when you make one step. So it's always a security. And as we saw this, this uh, with the MPC theory, by imposing that this constraint is always satisfied, if you don't have any perturbations, and then you don't have to follow this rule to decide when to recompute, well, it's going to be stable. And just to show you, because I haven't shown the, the historical milestone, this is the typical motion that you obtain. So here they were, they were doing some emotional motion, so what happened if you want to transport and things like that. But basically here you see the use of the scheme. See, they always impose that in the future two steps, the robot is able to stop. And that's enough to obtain a steady movement. Then, what was done in the uh, Technical University in Munich? They built two quite impressive robots, Johnny and Lola. Well, they decided to use a uh, three mass model. So, the same kind of model before, but only three mass. Okay, three mass means one for the uh, upper body and one for each leg. So, that's an approximate model. Okay. And then they say, well, we fix the footsteps, we fix the motion of the center of pressure, but we leave one or two, or one, we have two degrees of freedom freeing this motion. So this motion is 
pretty fine, except for one or two degrees of freedom. And this one or two degrees of freedom I use so as to impose this constraint. So as to impose that at the end of the motion, two steps later, the center of mass is there. So, here it's, it looks like a capturability constraint. You just impose that the center of mass is still there. But you, you see that there's no constraint on the same speed. So, in fact, capturability is not really constraint. So here they impose the position of the mass for some time and not speed. So capture is not constrained. So in some way, there's a failure here in applying proper theory. Hopefully, systems are robust to uh, design errors, so it works. But regarding a theory, um, there's a failure here. Um, maybe we can show you a video of uh, just what happened. To show you that just following these simple rules, I tell you how this works. Okay. How to focus on the week and, and Thomas Buchmann. So he was doing Thomas Buchmann was doing his PG thesis on the control of, of Johnny Andola, and he was the one who proposed this scheme. Mm -hmm. What about the Asimov robots? Interestingly, the people in Asimov made the same choice as uh, Thomas Buchmann and Johnny or many of the others. He got inspired by their papers. So people in Honda, they use a three mass model. They use a pretty fine motion, pretty fine full steps, pretty fine trajectory for the center of pressure, except for one or two degrees of freedom, which are used to satisfy this constraint, which is at the capture point. And this time they use the proper capture point constraint. The capture point, after a certain time, so here two steps later, should be here in the control position. Okay? And that's how they generate wobbly motion online for the acid roll. Now you can try to do better. Just following other options, there was a long history of, of uh, great robots of Sumito Fingers, Todai. And um, so, uh, Dr. Nishiwaki, in, uh, was 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago, the H7 had two roles H1, H2, H3, H7. And then they moved to H2. So, the robots this scheme. And in fact, it's the same team, scheme which has been used later by Toyota for their new robots. The scheme is the following: you can recognize the cool dynamics. And in fact, in this cool dynamics, the angular momentum is supposed to be fixed. And what's going to be adapted is the exact motion of the center of mass. And it's going to be adapted by an iterative process so that the center of pressure, because here the equation for the center of pressure, Converges to the center of the full steps. So the full steps are predefined as before, and then you will try to find a motion for which you, point, you, you put the center of pressure in the middle of the full steps while imposing this constraint. And here we move back to this approximate capturability constraint. You only impose the position of the center of the mass, but it works. Um, the last one we call this uh, series, we define the steps, that was used on the Sony Curio robot, which was very interesting for us. Unfortunately, it was, it was uh, terrible uh, news when they stopped working on the Curio robot. So what they did was using this single mass model <laughs> that uh, they were working with. And instead of imposing that it follows a predefined motion and just leave one or two degrees of freedom free, they say, well, let's try to minimize this uh, squared sum of it. So we try to follow this as much as possible while imposing this constraint. So here constraint on both position and speed. So that imposes capturability. But maybe that so that imposes not only capturability but also stopping there. Okay. So you can see always the same 
if you go inside the equations, below the equations, of course, everything we are right his own ideas and system in different, in different forms. But you can see, in fact, if you take everything in the same form, they all follow the same idea. So, another group of uh, propositions were still with predefined concepts, but without on, on capturing the constraint. Because for all these schemes here that we saw, since they don't minimize anything except for this one, but this one doesn't minimize, so it minimizes, in fact, tries to follow the dynamics here. So it doesn't minimize in some way, in a proper way, uh, an integral of the acceleration or jerk or derivative of mass. So all of them, the stability is, rests on this uh, capturability constraint. So it means that if you have to adapt to perturbation, to recompute, you need, as I mentioned, this complex decision as to how, when to make it, when to recompute, and how to recompute. So, in fact, in all these schemes, there was no uh, possibility to recompute because they didn't go through all these uh, complex forces. So, in all these schemes, the walking is pre computed and then replaced. So, that means no reactivity at all. So, that's where comes solutions without actually being constrained, but focusing on minimizing integrals. And here you have one of the most influential papers. Uh, it was proposed by Kachita in 2003, 10 years ago. And so it was called preview control of the MPs and MP preview control. And what he says is that, well, let's minimize this integral for two steps. Okay, so we have this finite horizon and we want to minimize this so here what we have is that it has a pretty fine um, angular momentum. Okay. And then he wants to compute the motion of the center of mass such that here the center of pressure is as close as possible to the center of the pit. But at the same time, with some weight, minimizing the third derivative of the center of mass. And that's the key, as we can observe for when I was proposing a violent analysis, that if you manage to keep this small, you know that you are going to fall to fall. So by minimizing the combination of those two things, you know that you have a stable motion which satisfies the equation of the dynamics, the constraint of the center of pressure. That was great. Well, why is the jerk of the center of mass a measure? I mean, what I showed maybe very quickly, but what I show here is that if you keep any derivative of the motion of the center of mass finite, then you are stable. Because if you are, if you are going to fall, everything diverges exponentially. So you can choose any derivative of the, center, of the motion of the center of mass. Kajita happens to have chosen the third derivative. That's not so maybe one option is that one, one reason, so there are some more intricate reasons, but uh, and his explanation is that he doesn't want to interfere with the acceleration. He doesn't want to interfere with the speed and position because he uses already position and acceleration for the dynamics. So that's, that's how you dynamics of, of the motion. So he wanted just you know, a higher period, and that's it. Moreover, you can, you, of course, you can see that uh, from your knowledge of linear dynamics that the higher derivative will diverge more quickly. So the higher derivative you consider, the faster you can react to and stability. Now, of course, the higher derivative means the more noisy uh, your system is. So, well, he chose the first. That's it. And you can choose something else. Now, we show you how you choose something else. Maybe. Um, a variant, I call it the Korean variant because it's, uh, it was proposed by some Korean guys, but not from a famous university, so I, can't, I can never remember. You have the reference, you can read uh, Just so the same thing, but let's consider that the angular momentum is not fixed. Let's consider it's a variable. And then, so if you consider he it as a variable, then you want to minimize it in some way. And you can do that. Just mentioning that you can use the full exact model and still compute what we want. And of course, they claim in their paper that have no reasons. Then you have my 
my first proposition. Well, what is my first success? Much later than my PhD. Days. So I, I, because I visited the, the lab uh, where Kajita is working, Kajita, and uh, so I observed, observed this gene. And I, I said, well, you know, maybe. So the problem with this gene here is that you can recompute every millisecond your control law. It's good. It's very good. And if you, so if you push the robot, you can have some reactivity to your system. So here, let me make, uh, uh, remind you that we are still with predefined full step in this case. But still, predefined full step, but you can have some adaptation of the motion of the mass. But here, by minimizing those two things, you are not sure that your center of pressure, here you want your center of pressure to be as close as possible to the center of the foot. But if you have a strong perturbation, maybe it's going to go outside your support window. So maybe your robot is going to fall. So I was proposing, well, let's let's impose that the center of pressure here with, with this model is inside the support polygon, is inside the convex load. So we'll use a constraint control rule. And then we just need to minimize this derivative. So far, I just wanted to be consolidated. It worked, so let's modify as few as possible. So I said, let's keep the first derivative. That's it. And it works. And this is a paper that uh, Adelan decided to implement. Um, so, in, in, uh, in the current uh, method, that's what they do. And so that time, the reaction from colleagues was, well, but you saw the constraint problem that's much more costly to solve. Uh, that takes much more time. You need a QP solver. You need uh, iterative uh, processes. So uh, I believe this was an error from their side. And that's why I'm going to show you a little bit about numerical implementations and why you can just as fast consider strict constraints. But before going to um, uh, walking without fixing footsteps, I just want to have to just present one idea, which I think is uh, striking, at least to me. It was not in robotics, but in, it was proposed by Michel van der Pan uh, in, in, in uh, your row, your row of graphics, so it was never used for robots. But it's very striking. What he does, what he says that, well, you know, let's minimize this integral for one or two steps, okay? and then just recompute it. So that's the same uh, NPC scheme or similar NPC scheme, and he used it to generate such walking motion. And the striking thing here is that what he imposes here is um, that the center of pressure is close to the center of the fit. Okay, fair enough. But here it doesn't, he doesn't minimize the derivative of the motion of the center of mass. What he does here is, is, is in fact, Keep the leg uh, length, yeah. the distance between the center of mass and the center of the foot, well, rather constant, because he was generating 3D motion. So here there was nothing related to the stability analysis that I proposed. And yet, it worked. You can see here uh, the plan is always changing, but in the end it works. Here, the only thing that he does is he proposes that he has two more steps which are feasible, and that's all. So, there's, I have no theory to explain why it works. Um, it's a very bold idea, and it works. So there's maybe room for thought here, and try to understand, and maybe simplify those things. Now what about adaptive steps, because of course, we, we had with those things some bit of adaptation because we know that the most efficient way to walk is to be able to adapt your footsteps to what's happening. So here is a paper which uh, now they they are in the process of integrating in the in the future now walking up. In fact, it's obvious. It's obvious. Just take the same dynamic equation that we have. 
but just don't impose these. That's it. Why impose the full steps? Just don't impose them. So you have these constraints. So the variables now are the motion of the center of mass and the position of the full steps. And you have this constraint. Okay, and how do you make sure that your motion is stable? Just minimize the integral of the norm of any derivative of the motion of the center of mass. And let's take on the spin, another jerk. First derivative, it's fine enough. And let's say, if I go back, I want the speed to follow a given reference speed. It looks so obvious. Just write the equation of the dynamics and say, go in this direction. And it works. So I proposed this with uh, one of my PhD students three, four years ago. Um, so you can see that it took me 13 years of research on Bible robots to end up with this obvious way of making robots. The most obvious things are not always the simplest thing to discover. Yet, so it works. And here you can see an experience. So, first experiments were done on the HR2 robot in Japan. I had my PhD student hidden there. And what he was doing, so he is completely online. And he was saying, go forward, go left, go right, etc. Without even informing the guy here, he's completely nervous. He doesn't know in which direction the robot is going to walk because it changes on the fly. And, and my PhD student was nice enough not to tell him in advance. So, you have this slow, but it's time and motion happening. And you can see that even sometimes in mid air, you know, he was uh, beginning a step and then suddenly walk backwards. So, you have this. Um, who reactivity? See, you can change the motion online. What you just say is go in this direction, go in that direction. And then you can bloody uh, vision feedback. So here it was just saying, you want, I want to see those. Uh, so this is the fifth form of the robot. It's accelerating quite so So we'll always go slow in that experiment. Maybe something that you don't want to go up, to go fast. Um, but saying, well, you, I want to see, let's say that this is the goal, and you want to face the goal, or you want to see, see the, the situation from different angles. And this is the telephone that we need. Another option, um, which is, uh, has been proposed recently in Tokyo University, in Tokyo Dai. Um, I mean, can you be more, more simple than this? This is how they generate motion. So what they say is that, well, let's just impose a terminal constraint. Okay, terminal constraint, which is a capture point, should be controlled to some desired value um, after n steps. But then those n steps are free, just wherever you want. Put your steps wherever you want, and just impose that after the n steps, you stop. And that's all you need to have a minor decision of replacement. And you will see. And what they did is just you know, free footstep, just impose capturability after n steps, and try to find n as low as you can. Now, of course, if you remember, what I told you is that if you work on a terminal constraint and not with a cost uh, function that I was proposing, then you cannot, it's hard to decide when to adapt to perturbations. It's hard to find when you recompute or not, because changing your mind in the wrong way can lead to fail. And you can see here that in this case, it was a very special case. They know when and they know how to change, because they know that they are doing nothing. And as soon as something happens, you react. Whereas then it was later used for walking. And you can see that when it's walking, well, they do much more uh, slower perturbations, because then they have it's more it's hard to decide when it should. So it works, but maybe not as, as impressive as the one when it was standing. When you see this huge. Thing. That is the, a major concern with with any kind of motion that we may want to generate on our kind of robot, 
the fact that we are severely limited in the, in the torque that we can generate in the joints, like this particular robot can only do that because they use the capacitors to get extra power yes. to the joints. So yes. they can, and that's similarly to the, to the big dog from the Boston Dynamics system and that does, they have these hydraulic generators, so yes. they can actually generate motions. Whereas for us, most of those would be just impossible um, because of the constraints of the torque. Yes. So um, I speak a little bit in the paper about uh, some very uh, important uh, results obtained recently. So deciding what's the best option to react to perturbation. So first idea you can use angular momentum. And then it was, sh it was shown that it doesn't help that much. What's more effective is uh, to make footsteps, adaptive footsteps. But then you have two potential variables. One is the length and one is the speed. And it was shown that the most important thing is to have fast steps. Because the of course, the more you wait before making the step, you know, and, and wait means also the time you need to realize the step, then of course, the more destabilized you are in, in time. So, speed of reaction and speed of execution are, of course, key to uh, robustness. And there you have, of course, the limits of, uh, of your motors. Yes, definitely. And that's well, the reason why I was just about to, to uh, show some, some videos of, of, uh, of uh, Boston Dynamics robots. And when you see those results, we have similar ones. For example, uh, so this student uh, of mine who did that, uh, sorry, that experiment, they just went uh, in postdoc in DLR in the case I got. And they, they do similar experiments. Uh, they, just last week, they did similar experiments to this one. Pushing the robot way it works, and it makes a step, a step on the side. But for the same, it's not, it's not more impressive than this. It's just a this. You, you give it small nudges, and so it's far less impressive than Big Dog, uh, 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 or even Atlas. Uh, but that's mainly, mostly because well, it's actually it's very, very fast and very powerful, and with the dumping of people. So that's the choice. So that's. Uh, one of the main choices that Mark Rebert made in 30 years ago, in the beginning of the 80s, he just said we have to use hybrid uh, systems. And he kept using hybrid systems since then. And you can see the result, which I'm interested in. Then, of course, the problem is that well, you, uh, you need a compressor, it takes noise. And so, if you want uh, robots in everyday life, so far, the hybrid uh, systems are not ready. So, what are the key ingredients here? Just to wrap up. So you, you have the observation that what we want is viability or capturability. You have those two things. And the key ingredient which was used all the way was this idea of artificial synergy synthesis, saying we focus on a few degrees of freedom, especially on the motion of super mass, and all the rest. Let me solve uh, externally. Um, it's another problem, and most of the time it just works well. And then how to go, how to then we know what we want to do, how to do it, and we use one of the and different options. And we can see that all the robots I mentioned in front. Then what about Boston Dynamics? This robot, which is uh, one of the most impressive. Well, um, um, Toyota published some of their ideas, Honda published some of their ideas. Obviously, they don't publish all their ideas, they have their systems. Uh, most of the ideas they don't publish. So, we only have hearsay. We know what Mark Rebert was doing in the 80s and 90s. We can see high of what's there. We can discuss with those guys and tell us a few things. And the general idea is that they do similar things to what you have seen. There is no match, there is no great idea that nobody ever had behind there. But then they have wonderful hardware and uh, 
because I'm not really thinking about this. Okay, so um, last slide and then we can go for a break. What if you don't want or don't have computing resources? For example, what happened in uh, the leg lab in the MIT in the 80s, beginning of the 80s? Don't have any CPU at the time. You can't solve the QP or an optimization problem like that so fast. How do you do it? Well, you combine single rules. So you have those robots, as you can see, they were mostly jumping. So you have one control for the vertical oscillation. You have one control for the upper attitude. And then you have a control of the step placement. And of course, that was the key to the long term study. But this was done every time with very simple P control, linear. You just have a linear control of vertical solution, vertical, uh, a linear control of the attitude, and a linear control of step placement, which was using, in fact, a simple analysis of the special abyss. They, 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 Found what they call the neutral position, which is if you put your foot there in the, in the beginning of a stance, then you will end up with the same speed as you began. So, neutral position because you don't change your speed. And then from this neutral position, you just adapt with a linear law. If you, if you put your, your foot position a little bit on the leg, then you will go more on the right or a bit uh, behind and you go forward and things like that. It's a very simple look. Similar thing here. What if you want to go biomimetic? Then people say, well, you know, uh, I want to see how uh, uh, biological systems work. So I will use central pattern generated CPGs, which are oscillators. So you just generate a motion, uh, an oscillatory motion, and then you want to stabilize it. And what do people do? They control the public attitude. And mostly adapt step placement with always the same simple linear rule. So the point here is that you can see that it's not very important what you do with your global motion. On the Hugo robot, they even tune by hand the walking motion. Okay? Because that's not that important to what the whole body motion is. What's important is then that you have some simple rule to stabilize, and especially so, so either stabilize the motion of the center of mass with respect to the foot position, or choose the position, the foot position with respect to the motion of the center of mass. So either you move your feet or you move the center of mass, but you use those two things, and that's it. And you, need, you can only use simple rules. So, however, of course, since he, he was using, or people are using separate rules. Um, which are then combined, the end result is sometimes shaky, not optimal. So that's why I think so. Nobody, most people now don't use things and, and use the other optimization scheme I mean, uh, based, uh, optimization based scheme that I show because they have they are more integrated and they have um, uh, better results like uh, visual feedback, uh, uh, smooth vision feedback. So, after all that, um, I think I told you everything I know almost, and the rest you can find in the, in the written notes about how people generate dynamic walking motions on robots uh, today. Okay, I can't tell you anything more. Then, of course, you see that there's room for improvement, and that's up to you. And so I propose that we make a break now, maybe. And then we we'll speak. Uh, the second part will be uh, maybe shorter, so that we end up at uh, 12 anyway. Um, so we'll do a bit about motion force control and then numerical implementations. How do you really program those things?
very often used for, for the working groups. So now, how do you control CMD? So remember, this was the uh, picture of the dynamics when you forget about the angular momentum and then focus on the capture point. So you have the center of mass, the capture point, the center of pressure. So what if you want to control the center of mass to go in a specific position? Well, we know that the center of mass is always going into the direction of the capture point. So if you want the center of mass to go to a specific position, let's put the capture point in this position. And then we know that the capture point is going away from the center of pressure. So if you, if you want, for example, the capture point to go here, then we need to put the center of pressure somewhere there. Okay. So of course that can depend on, on where is your where are the different feet on the ground. But basically, if you want to, you are you, if, since you push the capture point away from the center of pressure, you must have if you if you want to put it in some direction, you have to put the center of pressure in one. And that's basically what you do with the equations. So that was the corresponding dynamics. Uh, the first order dynamics for which is convergent and here which is divergent. We want to center of mass converging to the capture point. The kind of capture point converging, but diverging away from the center of pressure. And basically, this is the kind of control that you can use. You say, if I want to go to this reference position for the center of mass, I see where is my capture point with respect to this reference. So I go away from this reference. With a factor k which is greater than one, and this is where I put my my center of pressure. Okay, so if my desired position for center of mass is here, I take this this sector here, and I put my center of pressure away, so with a factor greater than one away from here. So then I will push in the right direction. So this is this equation with k greater than one, and of course if you put this here. You end up with very simply this equation, where you can see that if k is greater than one, then the, your your speed is going to make your capture point converge to your desired position, and then your center of mass is going to follow it on the chain. So that's called uh, capture point control. So this is from the goal. I, I think I guess I'm not really told you a bit about that. Maybe you could do a few of that. But that's what they use on the robot in CR. But in fact, it has been uh, invented elsewhere, so in different ways. So, uh, Professor Sumihara, I think now she's a professor in Osaka University, he studied, in fact, uh, different controllers for the center of mass and the center of pressure, which is called the ZMP, and he showed that. What he calls the best C wave ZMP controller, that the title of the paper, is in fact this controller. So you can see different researchers having different looks at the problem just show that, well, this is the best way to control the motion of the center of mass. Now, what about force control? So the robot, the motion of the robot completely depends on the contact forces. That's what we see. And the problem, the main problem that we have in, in controlling the forces for walking is that you have oscillations. You can see many oscillations in a robot in many situations. Especially because when you walk, you keep hitting the ground. And every time, well, that uh, interesting oscillations in your system. So the main goal that you have usually for force control is dumping. That's usually what, what people do. You can even see. If you look closely at videos of the Honda robots, or if you look at the videos of the HRP2 robot, or if you know how they are done, you know that they, are, they have uh, elastic uh, parts in the angles so as to dump uh, those oscillations. So it's the main focus of the force controls. But of course, if you introduce dumping, we introduce delay. With respect to the, your desired force, you need to realize your desired force but with some delay. So, what should you do? 
box. So some people, like from the idea, he said not, I mean, with his user, Johannes and Bertega, he showed that, well, this controller is robust to some, to some extent with respect to delay in uh, your, your uh, simple operation. So you have, so this gives you what, where you should put your center of pressure to control super fast. But even if you don't, if you realize this control with some delay, it will still be stable. So one option is to show that, well, it doesn't count much. Another option is to say, well, maybe it doesn't count much, but it counts. So maybe it would be better to take this into account. So just consider that the, the, the real position of the center of uh, pressure, so the real position, it's not exactly the desired one, and because of your controller, you have some delay. So your, your, your center of pressure is going to converge to your desired center of pressure, but to some delay. So you do some dynamic signing out. And then what you do is that you take the same controller and you add another term here with respect to your current position of your, of your center of pressure, and that gives you your desired position of the center of pressure. So you, 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 so this was proposed by uh, Kajita. This is how they made when both this uh, demonstration in 2010. So the HRP4 robot, which is very interesting to see in real life. So walking on the pavement. So here, the walking motion was really fine. And uh, what was tested is this uh, motion stabilizer. See, how do you control force and motion so that we see that uh, from an angle that there's, the, in fact, uh, there is an angle here, and here have a real uh, flow with, uh, with uh, it's noisy, but just showing that this controller, you know, which uh, will decide where to put the, the center of pressure, knowing that you have some, uh, some oscillations here, and then able to follow the results. So, that's the kind of things that you have. So here the slope was not low. The noise here and in, in, uh, on the dirt here, which have different bumping if, uh, effects, are not low, not low. And that's the robustness of the study. So that's, of course, here you have some controller that gives you where you want to put your center of pressure. What happens if, when you have strong perturbation, you want to put the center of pressure outside of your support okay. This equation that gives you Z to be here, it's outside of your What you do? Of course, and that's what people do so far, you can saturate, say, well, okay, I want to put there, but we will stay here because anyway, my support will be right here, so I should be put here. And then hope for the best. Okay. So you just saturate your controller and hope that the other way would be to take into account this constraint. But then that falls back to the constraint dynamics that we're dealing with when generating the working motion. So in fact, what we should do is not generate working motions and then realize them with a stabilizer like that, but try to combine those two things together and say we will feedback this kind of feedback directly even the generation of the motions. And that's what a lot of people are trying to do. That's what we are trying to do with uh, TLR uh, and with other colleagues. So people, uh, so the team by catch it up, so we'll work with HRP2 and HRP4. We are trying to combine in a single uh, computation the stabilization and the generation. But so far, you still have a separation between these two things. And this is still a work in progress. So, once again, I told you almost everything I know about motion and force control, and you can see that there's not much. So, maybe there's something I don't know, but all the robots that we see so far, there's not much more than this, as far as I know. So, I wonder that we now speak about um, numerical implementation. So we we'll begin by a, by a quote by a famous, I don't know if you know him, he's famous, 
So they have invented object or into program. So that's quite something. Uh, and K. She, she worked at that time in, in the Xerox Spark. So basically it's the scientists. And she, she made this thing. People who are really serious about self-creation should make their own hard. So I'm not the same as I'm the one K, but I'm going to, so I'm going to borrow his uh, quote. I didn't hear it much yet so far. Um, <laughs> people who are really serious about control algorithms should make their own English to solve. For exactly the same reason. You know, you, you need to know what's happening with you, and you need to, if you, if you want to push your software, if you want to push your algorithm, control algorithms, further and further, then you will need to tune and modify and make your own underlying technology. So, first thing, we have seen that in all those control schemes, in one way or another, they compute a um, dynamic motion by solving the equations of motion for some time, for one step, two steps, three steps, and then optimize. So they work on trajectories, everywhere. So of course, we do not work on a continuous trajectory, we work at a discretized trajectory, and in computer uh, computation. So for example, uh, that's uh, so in Tokyo University, they say, well, let's sample our actual trajectory. So between 50 and 100 times, so we have 50 and 50 and 100 samples. Uh, so knowing that they were considered three steps that take uh, that this kind of, of length of time, so that makes a sample every 50 minutes. So Thomas Buchmann in Munich, he proposed to use cubic plans, so three steps. Mm -hmm. Um, so around 100 millisecond period with uh, 20 or 20 PC plus plan. The Grisawa for the HRP2 proposed to use quality or cryptic uh, polynomials piecewise. Um, so all the people, you know, so Takenaka, this is called the ASIMO robot, they use these pieces of line with uh, exponential parts for the two steps. So every 30 or 50 milliseconds for each piece. Um, so Jerry Pratt uses pieces of exponentials. You can see well general options like that. So on the pan, so that's uh, the graphics uh, option. So in Google Graphics, one of short uses two only two pieces of cubic pi. Um, Kajita in his uh, original paper for ZMP preview control was quite extreme. He was using samples every five seconds for uh, two to four steps. So that means 600 pieces of, of, uh, 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 of, of this trajectory. And so, uh, Arne Hertz was my key student, and we just showed, uh, proposed to use well, pieces that, you know, every 100 milliseconds, and pieces with uh, constant jerk, so cubic splines. So, basically, what we propose, let's use cubic splines for the motion of the square. And we consider split in 100 milliseconds because you can, uh, of course, if you're split, so between your, your control uh, points, your spine, you're going to vary. And of course, you want to make sure that it doesn't vary too wide. But you can bound the ratio of the, what's important, which is the COP. So you can very really easily analyze that if you give a maximum value for the COP, because that's the limit of your, uh, your support polygon. Then the validation uh, can be bounded with respect to the maximum functions of the mass and the square of the sampling uh, shape. So then it happens that if you take one millisecond, a uh, hundred millisecond uh, piece, um, that should be a few millimeters, two millimeters, or something like that, for a, for a human size robot, which is quite rare to see. So you just need to take, what, let's say, one centimeter, one centimeter margin within your so polygon and you see. So <coughs> let's go with uh, cubic splines with uh, control nodes for the spline every one hundred. Then you do this called uh, 
uh, length of time, which is about two steps. So we take 1.5 seconds. So you'll have 15 uh, parts, pieces in your, in your uh, project. So let's look at detailed formulas, if you want. Nobody complains, so we, let's go. Detailed formulas. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so but basically, so um, this is something that you can find in this paper by my PhD student. So if you want to take a nap now, you can try to the exact detail from this. Thing. But again, I'll show you. So basically, what you what we do, we have n steps in our uh, prediction. Okay, so we will compute the prediction for the next n n uh, something cubes. So we said cubic splines. Um, cubic splines can be represented in different ways. One way is to say I have control positions every for my n steps. Um, another way, the way we uh, we chose, is to say that it's in fact a, a, a piecewise uh, third of a polynomial with constant third derivative, so constant choice. Uh, I'm going to tell you later why we this choice. So basically, our, the value that we want to find is the third derivative of the jerk, that's how we call it in English, jerk of the central class, for every something k, for the next n something k. So we put this in a way, x and y coordinates. So that's what we want to find. And depending on this, of course, you can integrate on that, your dynamics. You have here, you have here, you have the third derivative, you can integrate to the second derivative, you can integrate to the first derivative, and then you have the motion. So here, if you say that you have the spin of the pass for the next n something periods, they will depend on this vector here of the jerk with some matrix here, and it will depend on the initial state. You can say the same for, for example, a linear combination of position and acceleration center of mass. For example, the center of pressure, which is a linear combination of position and acceleration. Acceleration is a linear function of this, position is a linear uh, uh, function of this. So you end up saying the position of the center of pressure for the next n steps, which I put in this vector is in fact a linear function of this jerk of the n steps with this matrix and then depending on the initial state so the current state position is in like so you have these and if you want the exact formulas for this these are just an integrated value the system so you have such simple matrices Uh, and if you are interested, you can do an exercise later to write this, but usually, you know, I just give the paper to my new students, but that's a result. However, there is, so in the paper, there is uh, one trick. So there is one mistake, and so you have to correct it, that's part of the exercise. Um, but anyway, so you have the laws for the So then, we have a function that's called to minimize. So I showed you that, for example, we want to minimize the, so you have the speed at four. So here, this is a vector with the x and y speed of the pass for the, all the next n something cases. I want to, to follow as much as possible and give you reference. Maybe it's interesting to still minimize the third derivative. And it proved to be interesting. So in fact, in this paper, we analyze in this paper here. Uh, so that's the Robotics Society of Japan Journal, which is called Autonomous Robots. Um, yeah, here. So if you only want to track speed as much as possible, you will have some oscillations in the motion of your robots. Small oscillations in the speed. So here it's just like adding some dumping so that you have a smoother uh, so it's not very important, but it helps having a smoother curve. Here, you can also add another term, which is, well, why not, anyway, 
trying to keep the center of pressure not too far from the middle. It always helps for the residents. So we have this uh, function that we want to minimize. Now, the position of the feet in the next n sub of period is not fixed. So if you take the position of the feet for the next sample period, so you take the current position of the foot on the ground. So this foot cannot move, it's on the ground, it's fixed there. So for the next few sampling periods, the position of the foot on the ground is this position. So you have one here. And then, then after some time, for some sampling periods, it will be the next step. And then for some time it will be the next step. And then for some time it will be the next step, etc. So here you have, in this vector here, the next few steps. So the next one, two, three steps, which are free variable in, in our problem. Okay, so we want to solve this kind of thing. So we have these matrices, additional matrices that we use. And the variable that we want to find are the Jerk of the center of mass, which will give us the motion of the center of mass and the position of the feet on the next steps. And of course, here we can recognize so this is directly the variable that we find. Here we saw that this is a linear function of this variable. And here we saw that this is a linear function of this variable. And this is a linear function of this variable. So we have, a, in fact, the sum of squares of a linear function. So this is a quadratic function. And you can express it normally in a normal, the standard way to express a quadratic function is in expressing to expressing it in this form. So here you have a Haitian matrix that you multiply on the right and the left by a variable. And here you have a linear term. So here I don't describe a linear term, uh, it's just the same rules. I justify how you make this matrix. So what we have is this function. And basically you have the same function x and y. These are orthogonal directions. So the function they are independent. So in fact you have a matrix which is this form is two times the same matrix on the diagram. So then in xk, what is our working variable? It will be the acceleration. Uh, the jerk in x and y coordinates, and the foot, the next foot steps in x and y coordinates. And then you just replace here the, this equation, this one and, and this one. And then by just recombining these, you obtain this kind of matrix. Okay? That's not too hard algebra. I mean, that's some standard algebra, you just recombine things, rewrite things, and you just end up saying, well, what I want to minimize is this. And this means, following a given trajectory, minimizing also the jerk, and, and uh, keeping the center of pressure not too far from the center. Then we have constraints. Uh, well, you have constraints on the center of pressure. So I have a center of pressure. I have the center of the foot on the ground for the next n something periods. Then if I just reorient, so here it's the orientation of the foot on the ground. And here is what this is to you in this stage. If you want to deal with it, then there are ways to deal with it, I, uh, which are described in the paper that I put it in close enough maths for today. So, so we saw this is given. So you have the rotation matrix. So depending on the orientation of your foot, it gives you this gives you the position of the center of pressure with respect to the center of the foot in the local frame of the foot. And then if you consider it how rectangular feet, you bound it by upper and lower values in X and Y coordinates. So you have a constraint of this form. And once again, well, these and these are linear function of of the, the working model I want to find, so you can write them as a linear equation. Okay. So what we want to do is minimize this quadratic function with this linear constraint, and that's a, um, what we call a quadratic problem. So then we want to solve this quadratic problem. 
But there's an interesting trick that we can do here. We can observe that, in fact, this constraint here can be made trivial by just making a change of variable. Because, so let's consider that you have this variable instead. This variable, which is the, so the position of the center of pressure. So this is the position of the center of pressure with respect to the center of the field in the local frame of the field. And we can make this change of variable because we can see here that those matrices that we have uh, are full round, triangular, and vertical. So we have a one to one correspondence between the jerk of the center of mass and the Low, the position of the center of pressure, the local pressure of, of the feet on the ground. So we have a one to one relation, so we can make this change of variable. By working with this variable instead of the jerk of the center of mass, the nice thing is that this constraint is made trivial. It's just that Z prime is between L and U. And we see that this makes a big difference. I just have one point. Why, why is there a lower bound on the, the different? between the um, zero moment point and the center of the point. Well, it's just um, to say that in x coordinate and in y coordinate, so x and y, it can go, so it, that's the two boundaries of your feet. Oh, in the other direction, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, how do we solve the product of program? And we have to go into more fields than this to really understand uh, so in case we don't have any constraints, we want to minimize this quadratic function. Do you know how you define what is the optimum function? So please, somebody raise your hand. Tell me how. Yeah. Actually, the maximum or minimum, depending on. Yes, so how do you define the minimum or the maximum? So, uh, Derivative. Derivative. Yeah. I think it's derivative. So. Yes. So the the minimum or the maximum or stationary point in the general case, but here we have a complex function, so it's a minimum, is a point where the derivative is zero. So that's what we do. In order to find the minimum here, the easiest way is to say let's find where the gradient, where the derivative is equal to zero. The derivative of this it is this. So that's a nice thing, but Perfect functions, you can find a minimum by just solving a linear equation. So, <coughs> I mean, it's hard to be a simple problem to solve. You have to solve a system of linear equations. Um, moreover, this matrix Q that we have here is mostly constant. All these things here are constant. Only this part are changing, and that's by one tenth of the matrix. So it means that you can already pre compute most of what you need to solve this in the system. Um, I was not sure, but funny, I said that it's key, the exact detail how to solve this. But there's this so the factorization of this matrix Q. And the thing is, that since most of it is already known, most of the factorization is already known. So really you can pre-process most of the computation. What happens when you have equality constraints? So when you want to minimize the same function, but now you have a constraint that ax plus p is equal to linear constraint. So we know that the minimum of this function is where the gradient is zero. But most probably the point where the gradient is zero is not, does not satisfy this constraint. It's not in this uh, subspace. So in this case, we're not looking at the point where the gradient is zero, but the point where the gradient is orthogonal to my constraint. Okay, so how do you do that? Usually you do that by introducing what's called like bond multipliers. So if you don't know anything about that, just trust me, you open a book on numerical optimization, that's second chapter. First chapter is this, second chapter is that. So you introduce leverage multipliers to use the transpose of this matrix. 
So what you need to find is a couple of values, x and lambda, such that you solve both well, on this constraint and you, and you find that the gradient is the orthogonal to this You can rearrange this, you can ju just group those two equations in this way. And then we can observe, you can prove that if your problem is complex, so if your matrix Q is invertible in the next few days, um, and if your constraints are nicely behaved as well, in the sense that they are true mark. Sorry, but that's just the way it Anyway, you know that this is invertible, this matrix is invertible, so you know that there is a unique solution in this case. So if your problem is Complex and everything is fine. You have a unique solution to this system. Okay, so solving this this equation gives you the minimum of the constraint point. So once again, what you need to do is just solve a system of linear equation. So you can observe, however, that with respect to the previous equation that you need to solve, this one is a bit bigger. So it's a bit big. It's a costs more to solve. There is one option, higher. What if the constraint is trivial? What if the constraint is, well, x plus b is equal to some x, some selection of x. So some of my variables, I fix them to some given values. So the selection, I use it by touching this underscore. I don't know how to Or you can use it, in fact, by saying I have a matrix E, but which is trivial, because when you see rows of ones, just selecting some variables, and those variables are fixed. So you could, of course, use the same Lagrange multiple as before. But in fact, since here this matrix is only is trivial with zeros and ones, this just means that for these lines here, lambda is equal to what happens here. Um, so that's not very interesting. And in fact, it's the other equations which are equal to zero. So what happens in fact here, what I what I should do is just I have fixed some variables. Fine. This part of the problem is already solved. I know those variables. So now I just select the remaining variables, extract from my matrix Q the columns and the rows which were corresponding to the values of the origin, just take them out of the problem. And I solve this set of equation, which is smaller. It's just it. You fix some variables, you have a smaller problem, you have the remaining variables to solve. So here you can see that in case, the constraints are trivial, having constraints help me solve my problem faster. It's, it's a small problem, faster to solve. So that's why here it's very interesting to make this change of value. Because, as I mentioned, when, or so, the, the first proposition by Kachita and the ZP control calorie is function that he was minimizing. Because he said that's fast to solve. Solving this amounts to solving this linear equation. And I can pre-compute my inverse of the matrix Q, and that's fine. Then I just have to make a matrix vector multiplication, or uh, I can do it a little faster, and find the solution. But you see here that introducing constraints, but making them trivial, can help you solve the problem even faster. The problem, however, is that here I was thinking about equality constraints. What if I have inequalities? So, and I'm sorry, I, I never managed to find a good way to introduce this, but so we will have to draw things in the air with my hands and try to help you understand. Um, when you have, um, so, when you have an inequality constraint, so here, I was saying, how do you find the minimum in this constraint? Most probably the place where the gradient is zero is not on this case. Now you have an equal inequality constraint. I mean, so my value of x should be less than something or more than something. So I have one chance out of two that the point here is on the right side, the correct side. Okay, so in some situations, the inequality doesn't change anything to my solution. It's the minimum. Minimum satisfies the equilibrium. So I just, it's just as if it was not. In the other case, then I'm stuck in the inequality. So if I'm 
And second, the FOET then holds as a decoding. Okay, so I just say, I'm on this degree, and then solve this. So, in fact, the whole process of solving a QP with inequality constraints amounts to finding which are the active constraints. How do we know which constraints hold the inequalities and which one we just don't care about? And that's where normally you need an iterative process. So, here you just need to try. You try, are these, if, if, I, if I activate those constraints, so do I have a solution? Yes, no, and then you just do it. The point is that, look at this. This is, um, so this is time. This is time, um, I mean real time in my experiments. So, with, so it's in, in the, so it's counted as number of something periods. Wrongly worded. So first something period, second is a corruption to something period. And here you have the prediction horizon. So um, meaning that uh, here it's the current uh, current uh, time, and, and then this is further and further in the future. And here, what is plotted here is what are the active constraints. So we need, in, in this equation here, the lower and upper bound of the simple equation, the ZNP, which, which one are active? So you can see the first thing, which should look obvious in some way, we have a pattern. And this pattern is that when you go, when you progress in time, the active constraints go closer and closer to your current position. So it's just here sliding in time. But what's important is also that it's well okay to slide in time, but it's always the same constraints which are active, and the same constraints which are inactive. The point is that if you want to solve a single QP, you need an iterative process to find which are the active constraints. But here we solve a sequence of QPs. But every sample period, we solve another QP. But this other QP is very similar to the previous one, which was very similar to the previous one. And in fact, we can make a good guess about what is going to be the next active set. You know, just look at what, what happened before, just the previous step, and just you know, guess. And if you make the right guess, you have no iteration at all to make if you have the exact guess. Then if you are slightly off, you need one or two equations. And that's what we observe. But you really don't need much more than one or two equations more, and most of the time just no iteration. Um, so and here you can see that there is a disturbance like in here. So here push the wall. So then you have suddenly a lot of constraints activated, but then they go with nice part. So it means that solving Quadratic program with inequality constraints, but if we have such a nice behavior, time behavior of the QP, then it's not more, not much more costly than solving a QP with equality constraints. And if my equality constraints happen to be trivial constraints, it's even faster to solve than a QP without constraints. So, my colleagues, when I propose to introduce inequality constraints, in, 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 so dynamic constraints on the on the COP that told me it will cost a lot to compute. I don't know. It will be faster to solve. And you can see that because if the COP is on the boundary and it's fixed, then I don't have to compute this one. I mean, it's less viable to my problem. Very good. I have one question about this. So you can predict which ones are going to be the active constraints, but can you be sure that that this is the optimal solution then. No, then you check. So you make this guess, yeah. you check, and then you apply the standard method. So you check if it's optimal. If it's not optimal, what should you do? Should you activate one more constraint or should you deactivate one constraint? And then you make your iterations. You see? So uh, I will, will speak about more in the next slide.
So the idea is that, in fact, this is a very standard uh, feature that you have in advanced QP solvers. Standard QP solvers just give them your matrices and they solve advanced ones. We can tell them, and this is my guess, of it. and they are made to take this into account and then iterate if necessary. So here you have computation time on the CPU of the HRP2, which is the core two duos, rather than the A and the A4. So uh, this is for the standard QP solver, and you can see it takes 40 minutes. And you can see that the computation time uh, varies. In fact, it varies depending on the number of iterations that we need. Then we began playing the solver, and in fact, designing our own solver. And so first thing is we pre so here we couldn't so we gave the matrices to the QP solver. And first thing that we can we can gain some time by pre-computing a few things. So that is I told you this matrix Q is, is already fixed for the most part, so you can pre-compute things. So you can gain this constant thing that you pre-compute. And then comes the fact that well you can you can uh, delete most of the iterations by using the previous active set as a case for the current part. And then you have these things. So you have nearly you know, zero. So here it's less, it's a fraction in the same. Uh, and you have it improved now, I can go over the code. So, um, and then sometimes you make one iteration, one iteration, zero, one, two, three, zero. And then sometimes you have some, some peaks, of course, because here you have suddenly. Many, many uh, constraints which indicate all that. But then we propose another thing, which is a quite standard idea, in fact. That, well, of course, let, let's put a, a limit on the computation time. Let's say that we just fit to two, two insects or two iterations, okay? maximum two iterations. So what happens is that we stop at the suboptimal point. But you can choose to have a specific algorithm here. So that you start with the suboptimal point, but which satisfies all your constraints. So you are sure that all your physical constraints are satisfied. It's only that you have you are not making the best choice. And the point is that, so you see what happens if you have, if you need to activate many constraints at once, you will activate only two. But the next something period, you will activate two more, two more. So we you 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 take some delay. In, uh, in finding the property set, but you will convert very quickly. So it's just a matter of finding how many iterations you allow with respect to how many activations happen at the mean value for the speed of statistics here. But it's quite well, straightforward. Usually, you do not need more than one or two iterations to convert very quickly to our system. So, um, here you have, you have some results we had a few years ago. Here, um, just mentioning that we also do this for full body motion control. So if you want to control a full body, but then you want to put inequalities on that, then you saw the QP, and you have the same things. And, and you know, the statistics is that 97% of the time, you don't, really need that, you don't do any iteration. And the the remaining 2.99% is only one. So you have that's that's an important message to take home is that you shouldn't be afraid of inequality constraints. And, and there are good solutions. Uh, what is in the previous slide, what is the meaning of the double line So in fact here um, you have the indices of the constraints. So you have the constraints in X and Y and upper and lower constraints. So in fact, you can see that, uh, so here <coughs> for, for one period, you had two constraints which were activated. And then the same two constraints. And when it goes out to zero, which is like the quicker at time, then it drops back down. No. In fact, you can see that it's not exactly uh, synchronized. In fact, this is the end of your horizon. This is the beginning of your horizon. So if they, have, they are synchronized with respect to your steps, 
of course, when you when you finish a step, it means that you are making a step uh, uh, there. So then you will have the exact uh, uh, matching, but here it was not matching exactly. Um, yes, so let me stop here. It's well, so we can have time so for this question. So basically, I wanted to show you. So those things are uh, things that we tested on the HRP2 robot and things that work every day on the HRP2 um, And things that uh, added on is currently. Uh, Porting, so checking and, and adapting to the now robot. But this time they, they use, they, cut, they go from our solver instead of doing them directly from scratch. And so this solver is available on, uh, in open source online already. So you can, if you check for, I will, I will give you the details. Uh, it's, it's called MPC or Gen. And you search for it on GitHub and you find it. Uh, in fact, it's, if you find a, a development robotics webpage on GitHub, then you will find it there. I don't recommend that you go to it now because it's still working progress, so you are going to waste time. But just to show you, it's already there, and if they commit, so students, uh, they are committing every, every week or so, and it's going to stabilize soon. And then we have a full access. The implementation such as this one, so implementation of these equations uh, equ for this scheme uh, with further tricks on tree computation of the like that. So then you can see how it's done. And this will be the ones from all of our prototypes of advanced uh, robotics. And um, Yes, but here, as I mentioned, I'm insisting on an important uh, message is that if you go into the details of your numerical solver, you can be much more clever. If you, if you, if you don't know about these things, about the QPs, then the common knowledge, I ask anybody, they tell you that it takes time. You know, many iterations, you don't know how much time because it varies, you know, and, and so you should avoid using this for your, for your robot control. Whereas you see, when you're when you clear enough, you can be very fast, and as I claim, you be faster than if you want to. So I hope that I convince you. Could I, could I ask you some more about the implementation though? Because if I were to do something like this, then like, did you implement this in MATLAB and use the, the under the MATLAB matrix and uh, inverse calculation? Because I would be extremely concerned about numerical stability, if, which I'm not an expert in. And uh, there's many pitfalls from what I understand. So that's Just in adding two numbers correctly together. So I, uh, and that's a problem with MATLAB. If you have a problem with the Western Institution, it was like that. Oh, um, okay. <laughs> that was my only solution. <laughs> okay. No, sorry. Uh, but, but that's so, first of all, you have a QP solver in the Mac app. It's called Quad okay. um, So, of course, so no. Um, so, let me say it differently. So, one of my PhD students, my current PhD students, so far, she's Implementing new ideas about all So here you want to work with the C++ code that we just used on and on and So she started with fresh implementation, not in my cloud, but in Octave. So yes, what he what he began with is just you know uh, coding this matrix and then sending it to the QP solver of Octave. But then the QP solver of Octave happens to be not reliable. So we know all the QP solvers. Uh, there are some which are free available. If you want the better ones, of course, you have to pay for them. One of the very good ones uh, is, is proposed by Stanford University. There's a, there's a huge group in the there. Uh, but you have to pay for them. I think it's $700 for a technical It's a very good one. And it allows, uh, right from the beginning, but it gives, it gives you a possibility to have all stars. So give this is my guess. So the only thing you have to do is use this software, which is probably important to your 
you go with the photon and compiler, and then link for example. Um, but when, once you have that, you just feed the matrices to the result, and that's it. And it's, it, it works without any further hassle. So uh, uh, as soon as you have reliable QB solver, and everything is uh, standard, so the matrix computations are not ill conditioned, so there's no trouble there. It's just a No, no, I, I mean, I, I understand that part, and I totally agree if you understand your matrices, then we can do some other factorization earlier with the monster. I was just more concerned about whether you actually brought it all the way down to a C++ code or whether you used some <laughs> properly debugged and implemented matrix libraries or, or even a few keys over itself that solved it. So, um, we do use reliable software. I mean, you have reliable software in C++ for some of the keys. C++ or Fortran, you can trust more. But uh, and for doing linear uh, algebra, so matrix factorization. But uh, let me insist that, um, at least in this situation, these qubits I showed, the one that we saw, they are very well needed, uh, well conditioned. So that even if you just you know, use textbooks method, for example, solving a problem, you need a choice key composition. Just you know, Wikipedia, choice key, you have the algorithm, you code it in C, and it should work. Because this word in the standard case, of course, if, if, you are, if you are nasty case in condition, then you need to drop the software. Mm -hmm. But this was the standard case, and hopefully this is the standard case. So yeah, you don't need much more. The, the important thing here is the QPS. And this takes time to code by yourself. This needs uh, very precise knowledge. So uh, this usually is already available. But unfortunately, you don't trust uh, every software. So I told you the okay, and, and one of my postdocs, I never use MATLAB, one of my postdocs told me that even when MATLAB is sometimes completely contrast. So, just to let you know that, so my PhD student in Octave, he began by just uh, so coding these matrices here, and then saying to QB solver, and it didn't work. So, well, we, we just linked an external QB solver. And it works. And so, so Sven asked me if I could propose uh, some exercises. And I, I thought about, uh, so there is this Octave code, which is free available. If you're interested, just ask me about the uh, GitHub uh, page of my instrument, <laughs> you can that look it. But the point is that uh, it can be used with uh, fresh implementation of Octave because you need this additional QP solver. So uh, we finally decided it was too complex to set up as an exercise. Okay, but basically, we take this uh, open source QP solver from Collins, um, link it properly, uh, install it, link it, use it, and then, then you have the, the simulations of, of uh, walking, of, well, you don't have to jump the full robot, but you can see the feet in the C1 motion. And if you want the more involved C plus implementation, like I said, it is readily available, maybe not uh, very useful, well, very helpful so far because it's still a work in progress, but it already works. So you can scope and so see. In fact, we use uh, the Eigen library for the linear algebra. And for the QP solver, you can see that we have QP solver for everything so far because we are developing our own, but so far we use the multi shell solvers. You can see those two if you're interested in wasting time. Are there are other questions now. I think it's time for this one. Or was it all to you? Or the all to the time? Sergio, you um, made the assumption that uh, the robot would uh, stop. Uh, in maybe two steps uh, in some uh, catch-up point. Uh, but but uh, is it also possible to define like a, a similar like generalized point where the robot would move with a certain desired speed? Okay, so 
Uh, yes, you told me you were going to ask this question. So, uh, basically, just mentioning that what you what you thinking about is what Mark Rebels was being a neutral position, as far as I understand. Which means, um, so if you don't want to stop in two steps, but you want to keep the current speed. Okay. So that's what he called a neutral position. This neutral position, you can compute it with analytical formulas in simple cases. Okay. Uh, however, for um, so that's what uh, Raybot was doing for his robots. Now, of course, this capture point here is only for stopping. So, do we have an analytical formula for when you don't want to stop and want to continue the same speed? The answer is no. We don't have the analytical formula. So, well, it doesn't mean that you can't find it. Uh, nobody looks for it. Um, so, here I mentioned the capture point for stopping in one step. You have a, a recent paper uh, by Jerry Pratt and all his colleagues, uh, in the two part paper in the International which is, which is a fabulous paper, which uh, just comes to the capture point for more complex models and then for many steps. So you, you, have, you have further developments of this idea, but not the one that you want. However, this is sold usually numerically. So, for example, the, the ASIMO scheme here, which is seeing the, so the capture point is, is <coughs> say, you put it in some position. How, it, how is this reference computed? In fact, they compute it so that they have a continuous scheme. So, if you look at the paper by Takenaka in uh, ICRA, to a 10, to a 9. We have the reference in the paper. Uh, basically, they, they, they go to this way. They say, well, I don't want to stop in two steps, I want to be in a cycle in two steps. Because I know that this is viable. It's not catchable, it's viable. And they, they then decide about where to put the C reference to something generally and so on. So, the idea is, uh, my idea about that, as you can see, is um, I prefer to focus on numerical uh, equation. Just put the whole equation, say where you want to go, that's it. Um, I, I believe that, uh, so it can be, it can be uh, more expensive to compute than if you have the exact uh, formula. But it's so much more flexible. And you can, so you can expand on it. Uh, see if you want the analytical formula, you can use some specific case. In the numerical case here, I was not considering the angular momentum, but I sh show you that some people consider it. Well, it's just a matter of adding this future, you know. And people now are combining this with uh, uh, hand uh, grasping, so that you can take into account the grasping force and maybe a compliance uh, directly in your NPC for the balance, so you can then anticipate your, your manipulation task for your balance and things like that. So <coughs> these numerical schemes can be expanded to more general cases. So that's why I would advocate for this instead of looking for the exact analytical solution for this specific case. And I believe uh, CPUs now. <laughs> all this, uh, it's not a problem. It was a problem 20 years ago. So, I believe, I believe yes, we shouldn't spend too much time on this. Although, as I said, uh, this uh, introduction of the capture point was brief. We didn't need, I mean, at the time when, when he chose that, Kajita was already making his robots work with the NPC scheme without criminal constraint. So we didn't need this to make robots work. But it helps us, it helps us understand a lot of things. Uh, it's very helpful. Because May I, may I uh, look at this uh, impressive worker that uh, Jackie uh, mm -hmm. brought? Uh, or that there are also versions that, that work 
on level ground with uh, some powering, uh, but, but they are mostly governed by sort of the natural dynamics. So mm -hmm. not only of, of this uh, inverted pendulum of, of the center of mass, but also by the hanging pendulum of the swing leg. Uh, and, and to me, uh, this looks much more natural in some way than uh, maybe uh, the HRP4 walking. So, so I can use, uh, show this. Uh, the HRP4, um, of course, this is very impressive that the robot doesn't know the disturbance of the stone and maybe uh, the tilt. Uh, uh, but, but still, it looks like, you know, very much like a robot walking and then uh, not being governed by any natural dynamics of the system. So, uh, is there any way to, like, uh, Combine the two things. So obviously we want uh, a little bit more uh, control than these passive walkers, but uh, on the other hand, uh, it's supposed to be energy efficient and maybe elegant and whatsoever. So what's your thought about uh, how to like get the best of the two worlds? Mm -hmm. So so in fact, it's part of the. It should be part of the, this chapter, but uh, not in this extract. So. So this chapter, I'm working on this with uh, Russ Ledwick, uh, who has been working on more natural walking. So, um, and that's the next section here. I think it starts with section four. And then the next section is uh, well, more efficient walking. So I believe, so there are a lot of misconceptions. I, so here I show you a couple of misconceptions, the minimum inequality pattern is not, it's just a minimum inequality pattern. Uh, inequality constraints, you know, should be afraid of. Them. Another misconception is why do those robots walk like robots? Okay. Uh, there are many reasons why. Uh, so, of course, uh, you had a serious problem in the 80s and 90s that you had to define footsteps. And that limited, of course, the possibility to push or to react. But as I try to convince you, this is something that we know how to solve now. So, uh, but you can see that yeah, this has been solved and still the road walk like robots. Because that's not so the problem is absolutely not to have dynamic motion. This is this is dynamic walk. The problem is related, so you have actuators, they, they use uh, position control motors, so not force control, so this means they have uh, very bad constraints on how, how dynamic your motion can be, so they have constraints like that. So stabilizing the force, that's the most important thing, is that controlling the contact force, because you know, Contact forces are what drive the world. And, and, and they have tremendous problems with that. But then, so far, most of them they use uh, inverse schematics, and you, are, you want to go freely over kinetic similarities, but we don't really have to do these things properly. So, you see, the problem in walking at the robot, in my opinion, comes from various problems, but those problems are not the most. The, not related to walking itself. It's more like robots today move like robots, not only human robots. Moving like robots so far is you know, making all the robots move like that. So it's not the problem. But the problem is not there. Now, as I so as we know, uh, the best way to uh, adapt perturbations by making a step. It's not by trying to fight against the perturbation, you are very easy. Either by using a center of mass, but then if you push enough, then you are going to go in this direction anyway. It's not by moving your uh, arms, so which will help you with the momentum, but this is very easy. We know that the best way is to make steps. And we know that the best way is to make fast steps. So you need fast control. We discussed this uh, earlier, uh, fast motors and things like that. Um, but we know that free position is very important. And of course, um, you have the dynamics of your system, the internal dynamics of your system. And these dynamics can be tuned to 
naturally find the proper step. When this is what you will have with those um, those passive and See, they if they are stable under certain centers and with certain initial conditions, it means that the dynamics drives the foot position. Where, you know, if it if it goes a bit faster, then the foot goes a bit further, so it slows down. So and then you can't do it to report constants. So but but so that's really to tune in the mechanics, so designing the mechanics. And that's something which so far we are trying to tackle in a serious way. So you have a lot of people design human robots out of you know it's a technological challenge. So the HRP2 or 4, they look human, they don't have the dynamics of the human. You know, the masses and, and uh, uh, so it, it doesn't match. So some people try to match the dynamics of humans, saying, no, that works, that's not it, and we think they do. Um, thinking that, well, maybe if this dynamics is way too, then maybe it will behave like One problem there, however, is friction. This is a huge part of human control of robots. Um, so you, you have to compensate for friction, so you need to have to add energy to the system anyway. Um, but basically, for me, the, the next step, where do those threads converge, between passive dynamic workers and those full fledged human robots, which can do many more things, but uh, in a more rigid way so far, is in. So you have things to do outside of the strict realm of leg locomotion, which are uh, more uh, better actuators, better motion and force control, those things to have more natural motion for robots anyway. So this needs to be done. Um, compliant motion are still you know, research for manipulated robots. So you need this. Um, and then uh, you need better mechanical design. I think this will be the components. I, I believe there is a, there will be a component. Yeah, what about springs? So uh, for the mouse, for example, uh, in his models, uh, the, the legs uh, always look very uh, springy, uh, like a linear uh, spring. Uh, and uh, yeah, we, we had also uh, on Tuesday two talks about uh, compliant mm -hmm. actuation by uh, because uh, we talked about uh, fixed compliance uh, or also variable compliance actuators, and, and there was uh, uh, the Japanese robots with uh, muscle-like uh, actuators that mm -hmm. are you know very compliant. Uh, so, what's your thought about uh, you know compliant uh, robots? So I've been working on uh, walking robots for 17 years. It's been 15 years that I keep hearing the question, so what about springs? You know, we all know that uh, biological systems, animals and humans uh, have springy elements which store energy and that's, uh, that would be the best way to do. But then the next thing is, well, okay, fine, we all agree that. We need to put springs somewhere, somehow, and use them. Somehow. And, but then that's the beginning of the problem. I, so, I, I, so, if you think that I, have, I know uh, mechanical robot designers, you know, they tell me you should use spring. You know, I can design your robot with spring. And I tell them, no, I don't want it. I, 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 I may not, or maybe they will control it and use it. I, personally, I don't have the knowledge. The people in TLR are going to this and out. They have been working for more than a decade on controlling system, robot systems with springs. Okay, so they, and then maybe in a few years they will be able to use it efficiently for walking. Maybe in a few years. Their robot here has springs. The Toro robot has uh, actuators with springs, but they don't use them so far for storing energy. And, um, in fact, their robot is position control as far as I know. So uh, they have an advanced uh, actuation system, but they don't use it in the way we would love to see it used. So using springs to, to store energy. So I, so I mean, 
we are we have all been convinced, uh, all people. You know, so the, the, the design of the HRP two and HRP four is far from idiot. He's a wonderful uh, roboticist. I can tell you, he knows everything about all that. But he has to make a choice today. What's the current technology? If I want a human robot to work today, okay. So one thing is to say what we should do, what we should look for in, for in 20 years. But today, the technology that very intelligent that we know how to use to make the world work is this one. And nobody's happy with it. But that's you know, what we should do. Everybody agrees that's what we should do. And you can see that it's only now that you have fireball like to, uh, and the pigments actuators and so forth to store energy and reduce it later. Um, because using on the springs, I don't know if it's really great for that you have a series of elastic actuators which were proposed, I don't know, 15 years ago in the MIT that. But not many boards so far. So people were waiting for viable humans actuators. They are coming. And so so uh, they so in uh, in Genova and they tried to introduce the new but so far so good uh, but so far no no robots no robot knows how to use that but we all agree that this will be the future. We are all eager so, first, I can't work, work on everything. So, I just I, I wait for people in DLR who work on the violin and like vehicles to one day solve this problem that we can use it. But so I think Mark Raver is in the 80s of the previous century, uh, the, at least for like running and hopping. Uh, he, he knew that, of course, their springs are even more important. Yes. Yes, but he was focusing on a very specific problem. Because he had very specific design for a very specific problem. You can observe that he was, for a long time, only working on jumping and running robots, not walking. Yeah. The funny thing is that the first reaction of a lot of people um, is that well, running is harder than walking. So if you know how to run, you should know how to walk. That's the general conception. Which is completely wrong. It's, it's very funny that you can observe, even observing them humans, it was measured. You have humans walk on a treadmill or run on a treadmill. And then you perturbate their CPU. So you make them uh, do uh, small numerical tasks, multiplications, things like that. So the, the, the brain is occupied something else. And then you perturbate. And you can observe that um, running is much more stable than walking. It's much easier to keep your balance by running. You need much less uh, brain power to run and to walk. Uh, that's as you measure the humans. And that's what we have observed, observed also in um, robots. And that's the reason why I had running, then many people running robots before they were walking So, Mark Raymond was the, the the reasons are impressive, but they're impressive because he was so clever that he chose the easiest thing to do. And then, if later you want the robot to not just run around, but you want it to get your beer and bring it to you and not shake it, then he can't do that. Yeah, but like uh, we can't uh, on this iPod and. Uh, Models mouse, uh, they, they apply these springy leg models also to walking, so they are not completely satisfied with that. Yet, yes, but, but, uh, but it arrived 15 years later. Yeah, it was only in the 90s, 15 years after Microbit was making to run, that they even in MIT they took 15 years to begin to have walking robots. So it's, it's much harder, <laughs> that's one thing. And then, what I, I agree, so springy legs are the thing that we have to know how to use them. That's the next thing that we need to understand, how to use them. But I mean, use them on real robots, not in the simulations of biological systems. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, so we need to do that. And if nobody did that so far, it's not because nobody thought about that. It's because people don't know how to do that. Um, So it's 
easy when you, you when you focus on a simple problem of yeah, uh, you have your mechanical your biomechanical model and you simulate it, and yet you know it needs a lot of tuning. It's easy if you, what you want is just a robot. It's easy, of course. It's easy to say that it's easy. Right? It needs some it needs a lot of work, but it's easier if you know what you need. All your robots will jump around. Now, if you want your robots to go through the door, catch your, open the fridge, uh, you catch the beer and bring it back to you, you can do that uh, as easy. And it will be much, much harder with springs because we don't know how to do it. That's, uh, that's how I, I see the current situation, how I feel it. Yeah. I may be wrong, but. An easier question. Uh, can you tell us more about the book you're working on and when it's going to be published? Oh, so, in fact, this is the, you know, the handbook of robotics? I see Chimano and Katy. So, it's a, you have the first edition, which really is which is a big, great book. Um, so, it has chapters on everything in robotics. Uh, what, one chapter on dynamics, one chapter on kinematics, and then, then it goes into further uh, refined details, like one chapter on electric motion. And Chapter on, on space robots and stuff. I think that that's it's a big book that you can already buy for a lot of books. Um, it's it's not the best book to learn things, maybe, uh, but it's a good reference book because it has everything, and all the chapters are written by uh, knowledgeable people. If I can say that, knowledgeable person on, on Lego robots, but uh, you have the, the best specialists on. Some of the best questions from each chapter. So it's a fair enough reference. So the first edition uh, went out three years ago. The chapter on lead locomotion was written by my PhD advisor, Panas Q, and uh, Kajita. So they wrote this ch the chapter at that time. Uh, for the second edition, which should go out next year, uh, most of the authors are changed. They've changed on Nakashita, wrote a paper with Christian Ott uh, on lean uh, robots. And I wrote this paper, the, the, I wrote the chapter on the motion the first page. Uh, but most of the chapters on visual surveying, on dynamics, on uh, even on robots are written with this paper. Questions? It's time to have lunch. Yeah, thanks a lot. <laughs>